I really appreciate you all being here to talk to. This is so important. And, you know, I don't know if it's, it, we were on fire back in the 80s, not because we were, you know, oh, well, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It just said it's launching again. But back in 1984, my friend Bonnie was in the hospital. She had cancer and she had five reconstructive surgeries. So, you know, we got to know the nurses really well. And if, you know, we were eating chips, we'd offer the nurse, you know how it is. And so she would, you know, take a chip and eat it or whatever. And, um, so we had a great relationship with the nurses. We were always on the same floor. And one day I saw these nurses out in the hall and they were drawing straws to see who would go in and check on this young man. And his um, door, I noticed had a big, they had moved him in there. He had a big red bag on his door and covered the entire door. And there was a little cart out there where you had to put on your paper gowns and your paper shoe covers. And I never really understood how that worked because wouldn't the AIDS germ just crawl right up your leg if you were wearing a dress or shorts, you know? It didn't make much sense. And um, I watched the tray, you know, when they would draw straws, they'd say, okay, well, best two out of three. Well, best eight out of 10. And then they would completely ignore the person in that room and go about their business. And, you know, I watched through, you know, his trays would line up out in the hall, his food trays. They're, they, and I didn't even know they had styrofoam trays, but they'd be on these little styrofoam trays with styrofoam bowls and, you know, everything was paper and disposable. And they would set his food on the floor and they would come back at lunch and they would set his lunch on the floor and his dinner on the floor and never come back and pick it up. No one was touching anything that came out of his room. Are y'all still there? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, I uh, was talking to Bonnie about it and I just couldn't stand it any longer. And I had a cousin or I have a cousin in Hawaii who is gay. So I had heard about that gay cancer that was happening. And I had been in Cal, I'd been in Hawaii the Christmas before and asked him, you know, are you worried about this thing that's happening? He goes, Oh no, no, that's just the leather guys in San Francisco. Well, here I was a 25 year old church lady what did I know about leather guys? But I thought, well, he's not worried about it. I'm not going to worry about him. So I came back and that's when I saw that door in that hospital room. So I eased myself down the hall when the nurses got busy and snuck into his room. And I walked in and he was just very skeletal and very sick. And you knew that it wasn't going to be long before he died. And I walked up to his bed and I took his hand in mine and I took his arm, you know, in my hand. And I said, honey, is there anything I can do for you? And he said he wanted his mama. And I thought, oh, good, I can do that. You know, well, that wasn't an impossible thing. So I marched myself out to the nurse's desk, proud, you know, as punch that I had found a problem and fixed it because they were going to call his mother for him. And I announced, you know, I said, his mother, re he really wants to see his mother. And they go, you didn't go in that room, did you? Did you go in that room right over there? And I said, well, yes. I said, y'all were busy. And, oh, well, you, and they treated me from then on like I had the mange. It was terrible. And, um, uh, so it went back and forth a little bit. And finally a nurse waited till the other nurses had left and she shoved his mother's name and phone number towards me and said, it's not going to do you any good. So I reached over to use their phone, which I had been using. And she goes, the phone is down the hall. And I go, okay, well, I see how this is going to go. So I went down the hall 
and um, I called his mother and I told her who I was and you know what I was doing and she goes I don't have a son and don't call me back and hung up on me and I thought oh no you don't I know I've got the right person so I called her back and I told her that if she hung up on me one more time, I would put her son's obituary in the newspaper and I would list his cause of death. So I had her perfect attention at that point. I knew she wasn't going to hang up. <clears throat> so she didn't. And she goes, well, I don't know what you've got up there at that hospital, but it's not my son. My son was a sinner and was just an awful person. And he died to me years ago. So don't even call me when he dies. Well, you pretty much know that I've got the right person. She's telling me everything. So I go back into, you know, I wasn't going to let those, and all the nurses were lined up down at the nurse's station, and I was not going to let them know that the phone call didn't go the way I wanted it to. So I had to put my face back on, my game face back on, and I went in his room, and when I walked up to the bed and took his hand in mine, he looked up at me, and he said, oh, mama. I knew you'd come. And I was just, my feet just froze to the floor. I mean, what was I going to do then? So I said, well, honey, I'll be right back. I'm here. I'll be right back. And I went down the hallway and I told Bonnie what had happened. And she just couldn't believe it either that no one was coming. And so uh, she said, you know what? I'm okay. He's the one that needs you. So I went back down the hall and I went in his room and I pulled up a chair and I sat with him for the next 13 hours while he took his last breaths on this earth. And I would sing, you know, a little lullaby or whatever. I would, whatever to pass the time. And I would read to him and I would tell him about hot springs and just kind of take him on a tour of town. And so when he finally died, I went out and told the nurses and there's, well, now what are you going to do with him? And I'm like, what am I going to do with him? He's not my problem. He's your problem. I said it a little nicer than that, but probably not a lot. And uh, they go, no, he's yours. We don't have any, there's no one we can call. None of the funeral homes will take him. Uh, and we don't want him here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so I started calling around to funeral homes and I had to get into the lower uh, income funeral homes because I knew that they could probably needed the money. And I finally found a funeral home after probably an hour of calling around. And they said, well, we will take him, but we will only cremate him. We won't touch the body or anything like that. And I said, that's fine with me. So I arranged for them to come and pick him up and I gave, uh, him, I guess I had to have given him my phone, my number, but I didn't think about it, my address. And um, one day I was sitting on the couch, it was a Saturday afternoon and the mailman arrives and he has this box, this little postal box. And I'm like, oh wow, somebody sent me something. <laughs> Let's open it and see what it is. <laughs> and it was his ashes. And I thought, oh no, what am I going to do with these? And I had told him about my cemetery. My mother had gotten mad at her oldest brother when I was 10 years old. They got in a vicious fight and my, not a fist fight or anything, but my mother went to the cemetery lady and bought all of the remaining grave spaces. So he and his family couldn't be buried with the rest of us. She bought 262 grave spaces. And I'm an only child. <laughs> and she, every Sunday, we would go out to the cemetery and she goes, someday all of this is going to be yours. <laughs> and I would 
think, well, I really like that diamond ring you have on. I think I would get much more use out of the, much more enjoyment than I would a cemetery. But who would think that 15 years later, there would come a time when families didn't want their children even to bury them, didn't even want them in the same cemetery with the rest of their families. And uh, that time had come. And so I thought, well, this is nice and I'll do this. And then, you know, my life will go back to normal and maybe I'll get in the junior league and, you know, do some things like that. And of course the junior league, I, I'm really not the junior league type. I'd like to think I am, but I'm really not. <laughs> and, and so anyway, I, uh, put a bow on my daughter's hair and fixed her up real cute. And I thought, oh, I've got to really figure this one out. So I took my daughter, she was two at the time, down to the pottery store with me and I had her fixed up real cute to where how he couldn't possibly tell me no. And I had the box of ashes under my arm and I just went down to Kimbo and I said, look, here's the deal. And, um, you know, I said, I need uh, something to put him in. And do you have anything that might be, it, maybe it didn't fire right, or maybe there was a chip in it or something. And so he gave me a cookie jar and, um, that's what I put the ashes in. And, um, I took him to the cemetery and I took a post hole digger and a pickaxe and I dug the grave on top of my daddy's grave because I told him that daddy would take good care of him and see that nothing happened. And, you know, my grandparents were there and I tried to, it's kind of crazy because I'm talking to a box of ashes, but I'm trying to reassure him that he's in a better place than he could have been wherever else he would have been buried. So we dug the grave and had a do-it-yourself funeral. And I'd never done that before, but I thought, well, this is the only one I'll have to do. So I've done this and now, you know, my good deeds done and they started coming. It was just a few days later, I got a phone call from another young man whose partner was dying and they just kept coming and coming. And for the next 10 years, they never stopped coming. And um, I, I, I buried them over 40 in my family cemetery because it was the same thing. Their families weren't coming and I could not imagine. I thought, wait a minute, that's what Jimmy's mother said, but you're not Jimmy's mother. And you're telling me the same thing that you don't want your son even to bury him. And they would go, yes, ma'am. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I just thought, well, if you're not going to take care of these young men and you're not going to see that they have a decent burial, then I'm going to do it. And my church, I'm United Methodist, which today that's not saying much with the way they've handled the LGBT situation. But, um, you know, I just... I just couldn't believe it. It was, it was just, and I was 25 years old. They took the minister uh, later on when I saw that this was really going to be a thing. And, you know, it was a, it was just horrendous. I asked him if I could have one room for us to have support meeting. And I was in a finance committee meeting and he said, surely you're not talking about bringing those people into this church, are you? And I said, oh no, Dr. Hayes, I'm not talking about bringing those people into this church. I'm talking about walking those people across your new $30,000 worth of grass that we just bought you, walking them into your new $300,000 home we just bought them, and setting their asses on your $40,000 worth of new furniture the church just bought you. That's what I'm talking about doing with those people. <laughs> 
<laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get put back on the finance committee. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was like that. And it was just unbelievable. So I, I really, I'm getting more and more men and I'm getting them now to where I'm taking care of them in their homes and uh, I'm keeping them at home while they're sick and while they're dying. And I'm not trying, I'm not a nurse, I'm a lay person. And um, it was, it was, it was the worst of times. It was so horrendous. I had, Billy was um, a, a thin young man, but he, um, Oh, he was probably about five nine, and he weighed fifty four pounds when he died. And Roger was six foot four and weighed seventy five pounds when he died. And my daughter said that she can remember seeing every organ in his body while he was laying in bed because there really wasn't much left besides skin and organs and bones. But um all of my, I loved every one of them. They were so special to me and we had the most fun. I mean, just because you're dying doesn't mean you can't laugh and things aren't funny. And I found that out with Bonnie. I noticed that no one was ever, once she was diagnosed with cancer, that was it. The jokes, no one told jokes anymore. Nothing was funny anymore. And you have to laugh. I mean, even if it's gallows humor and you learn how to sing Amazing Grace to the tune of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> and I can wait and let y'all figure that out while I'm getting this water out of the door. But um, it just, um, you had to do anything you could to keep their spirits up. But they really did a good job of keeping their own and they would keep my spirits up and they would take their AZT the day they died because they just knew that tomorrow it'd be on TV that they had a cure. And their families, the ones that I had, and you know, I was in this a long time and none, uh, I, I had two families who kept their loved ones at home, well, two and a half, the others, I'm not quite sure what that was, but they were, and the ones that were at home, they were trying to get the gay out of them and get them to, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Head gummit. Yeah, that's a good word. That's exactly what I was looking for. I've had a stroke, so I lose words every now and then. And, um, Roger was the one that weighed 75 pounds. And the thing that stuck out to me the most is after the funeral, they kept him at home, but they were going to get the gay out of him. And his sister, I had flown down air ambulance to pick Roger up. And um, his family, you know, they wanted him home. And I thought, well, that is wonderful. I don't have to do all this now. And, you know, he's in his family's hands, but there was no hospice or a hospice had just started coming out. There was one in Arkansas and it was in hot springs, but they wouldn't take an AIDS patient. Oh, no, no, no. So Roger, I, you know, we, had the ambulance meet us at the airport and I had the bed and just the whole hospital room set up for when we got back. And uh, he lived for maybe about, about six weeks and he was, um, he had a brain tumor, so he was paralyzed and he couldn't talk. But I knew he knew everything I was saying and I could see the glimmer in his eye and, you know, or if I would say something funny, I could tell that he was, you know, right there with me, but I can't imagine what all his parents did to him and his sister because one night right before he died, they called me to come out there. They said that, you know, there was an issue. So I go, I take Allison out there with me and we go out there and um, 
his dad had a tape rule and he would take, you know how you pull it out and let it pop and go back in and it makes that popping sound. And he kept pulling it out and, you know, sucking it back in. And uh, he said, we've got a problem. <clears throat> and I saw the preacher standing in the corner with his Bible and he was facing the corner and he was almost invisible, but not quite. And he said, well, we've been measuring the hot tub and the hot, I thought, oh my God, I know what's coming next. So, uh, and the problem is that the heater in the hot tub went out and this was on a Friday and uh, we can't get a new one in until Monday. And so I, you know, thought, oh man, this is really out of my pay grade. And what am I going to say to this family? So to make a long story short, you know, I said, look, my God and my Jesus, I'm pretty sure is the same as yours. And he agreed that it was, but they were very Pentecostal. So there was a, a layer of even deeper religion in it. And, um, I said, let's think about this. It, we, we christen at the church, so we just get water sprinkled on our heads. And do you think I'm a okay, good person? He said, well, of course. I said, well, do you think I'm going to heaven? He said, of course you are. If anybody is, it's you. And I said, well, see, then Roger could do the same thing. So why? what about you and Craig? taking Roger and, you know, holding him under the shower and letting the shower wash his perceived sins down. I had to be careful and I couldn't say that word, but anyway, wash down the drain. And they looked at each other and they thought that was a great idea, but they had to go and ask Kathy, dun, 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 the sister. And so she said, oh no, he has to be immersed because he is such a sinner and basically they had to get the gay out of him. And back then I really wondered and I, I wondered if it was the fact that they were gay or that they had AIDS. And I don't think that the AIDS part really registered with a lot of these families. I think it was the gay part that they were so desperate to get rid of. And of course, you know, AIDS was their punishment. And so, uh, but when I first walked in, he said, well, how long do you think Roger's got to live? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me go in and look at him and, you know, see what I think. And I came back out and I said, probably about three days. And he said, boys, go dam up the creek. And I thought, oh no, because this was the middle of October and they, the, all the grandchildren took off running down the hill and they dammed up the creek and they baptized him in the middle of uh, winter, I'll call it winter, they, and it was 32 degrees outside and they baptized him in the creek. So on Sunday, I get a call that Roger's in the hospital and i pretty much had figured that. And so I, by the time I got up there, I walked in the room and the whole family was there. And I walked in and she, his mother had him sitting upright in bed. I'm not really sure how they had that going, but she was trying to feed him oatmeal. She had a bowl and a spoon and she'd say, Roger, just eat Roger, just take a bite. And I walked over and I took the bowl out of her, I took the spoon out of her hand and I took the bowl out of her hand and handed it to somebody, I don't even know who. And she turned and just fell into my chest sobbing. And um, so after the funeral, I went out, they said, come out to the house, we have some things for you. And I, you know, I didn't, I thought they were for me. I wasn't really sure what they were talking about. And by the time I got out there, there were these ladies up on ladders with yellow uh, dish gloves on their hands and they were bleaching the ceiling fans to get 
AIDS germs out of the house. They were bleaching the walls. They had bleached everything and they had, I mean, his bedding, his clothes, his keepsakes, his tchotchke, everything they gave to me to give to someone else. But that was what it was like, probably everywhere. I, you know, I'm not sure they would baptize in the creek other places, but I'm not sure that it wasn't done. But there was such hysteria over it. It was, it was just, it was a very, very hard time, but it brought such uh, comfort to, we brought comfort to each other. And the National Institute of Health and the Center for Disease Control, and there was someone else, they sent people from Egypt and Israel and Sierra Leone and the World Health Organization down to me for a week to see what I was doing because my patients ended up living two years longer than the national average. And the only thing that they could find out was the fact that I love them. And they loved me and they knew they were loved and they knew they were cherished and they knew that I wanted them there. And um, so that's how it ended up. And I just kept taking them. And then after in the nineties with all the drugs that came out and the protease inhibitors and everything, my job became functionally obsolete. And, you know, it was a, it was a good thing. But then I thought, well, gosh, all these guys are living and I'll never get to meet them. But that's still a good thing. So that's kind of my aid story. Ruth, I mean, I, I could listen to you and your stories. Um, let's, let's hear from our audience if you want to make a comment or a question. Or we have uh, time for about two or three. I, Ruth, my name is Reyes Sanaya. Hi. Hi, thank you so, so much. I, I'm 61 and I'm years of age and I wanted to come and hear you. I, I knew about you from before and you're just eating the tip of the iceberg with what a, a lot of younger people uh, that don't know what we endured at that time. And I also was one of those caregivers and seeing it. And when Nick told me, I wouldn't cry right now, when he told me you were going to share um, that night I, I cried because I was thinking of all my friends that I helped uh, cross over and when their oh. family wasn't there either. But I, I want to thank, I just want to personally thank you for being one of the many of the armies of people that loved our brothers and sisters. How and, could I not? How could I not? Thank you. Beautiful men like you, I mean, no, people today, they don't have a clue because you can see a picture, but you can also close the book and not have to look at the picture. Sure. And, um, it, you know, it was just tough, tough times, but thank you so much. Thank you. I have a question. Ruth, please. Or my name's Sergio. Yes. Hi, Sergio. Wonderful. Hello. All these men that you care for, were they all local men to your area there in Arkansas, or were they coming from different areas? Well, what happened in, in the middle part of the United States, you know, I'm from a town of 32,000, but we had six and a half million tourists a year. Uh, it's the second most visited national park. And, um, what happens is you can't be a doctor or lawyer or anything and still and be gay in Arkansas. So these guys would graduate from high school and leave for college or just leave for a job and they would stay on the East Coast or the West Coast. And then when they got too sick to take care of themselves and there was no one still living that could take care of them, they had to come home to die. And, you know, some of them really did want to come home because it's home. And, you know, that's where you want to be when you're sick and dying. But 
I would, um, and there were some men that I didn't know anything about. And so I would get a pizza and go to their hospital room. And, you know, this is when they were still well enough to sit up and everything. And we'd have a pizza party and I'd make it a fun occasion because I would have to fill out their death certificate without it being a, you know, a gloomy thing to do. And they would have fun with it because I wouldn't know their mother's maiden name. And if you start asking people these questions, they're going to go, well, why do you want my mother's maiden name? Oh, so I can put on your death certificate. So people don't want to hear that. And that's when I decided to make it fun. And, uh, you know, they'd be pizza and I would, and back then you didn't get pizza very often. So it wasn't like it is today. So it was really a treat. And I would go, okay, now, you know, what was your mother's main name? Okay. What's your, and that's how we would have to fill out a death certificate and, you know, not be in tears. So go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think you're such an amazing person. My name's Brian. Um, Brian. And I just want to know what, so once the medication started working and that role wasn't there for you anymore, what did you do? How did you fill that space? Like, what did you do? Well, I did. I, I had been arranging all these funerals for all these years. And then um, I was talking to a lady at the funeral home and I'm like, wait a minute, you mean I can be getting paid for doing funerals? Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, yes. And I'm like, well, shoot, I'll do that because they say, do what you love. <laughs> you <know? laughs> And obviously I was going to love it or not because, you know, I already had a cemetery and then, you know, I had all these people who were dying and, um, you know, it was just something that I'm, you know, we didn't have, uh, Christmases and Thanksgivings when I was little, we had funerals and, um, that's when the family would get together and, you know, it it would be an event. Let me just put it that way. But, um, and so that's how I made a living. And I, uh, you know, even went back to the same families, the ones that had taken care of their sons and wrote their funerals for them. And so I, you know, I really, and then I moved later, moved to Florida and that's God's waiting room down there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make a ton of money writing funerals. And All right, one more question, Dean. Uh, sure. Hi, Ruth. My name is Dean Jackson. I lead the HIV uh, support group here. Yes. Um, and I'm one of those people who don't know what it's like. Um, I'm one of those people that, you know, I didn't see the problems I have run into are people not needing me <laughs> like oh they, yeah i you know hook them up with doctors pharmacies talk about the latest greatest meds they come to group a couple times and then they're off to their, life, their normal life um, wait i can't i'm having trouble could you say that again oh yeah um there you go i said <laughs> that um the problem i have is um, you know, I'll meet people who are just diagnosed and they'll need a little support at first. I'll get them connected to doctors, pharmacies, you know, the latest medications, and then I never see them again. Right. And so it's good for me to hear these things and thank you for doing all that you've done. And it's just so different than what I encounter. I mean, it's a good, it's a good problem to have that they don't need me. Right. Um, but it's just, it, it's so different now. And I just want to thank you for everything you've done. I can't even imagine. Well, thank you. It, I tell you, I'm, I'm very concerned about the young people today because, well, I'm concerned about everybody. People just, 
you know, they think that it's an old, it's an old man's disease and it doesn't happen now. And if it does happen, we'll just take some medicine and be done with it. And it's not that simple. I mean, you know that the, you know how rough those protease inhibitors are on and prep on the body. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Ruth. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It's been an honor to hear from you. And thank you for spending some time with us. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, have a good night, and we'll be we'll be posting this later. And thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.